I think that as you go along in this reading, you should try to remember that this is an author that more, even more than Plato, was taken up by people during the Middle Ages. Every community is established for some good, some purpose that is good okay, for people, which sounds like who can dispute that. Um, but he very quickly says that the city-state, which was the highest form of government um, in his day, the city-state was the highest and best community of all the communities. So there are lots of different communities, but the city-state is the best and the highest. Okay, so could could anybody dispute that? I mean, is that a um, a somewhat controversial thing to say? Do you know any libertarians who might have a problem with that statement? Because Aristotle seems to be saying the the bigger the better. In other words, every step of the way, the community becomes more self-sufficient, provides more happiness, more opportunities for participation, and so forth. So. But, you know, libertarians didn't exist back then, um, but they exist now, and they totally dispute this idea that the bigger the better, right? Um, because they say what? Well, what is it about the bigness of a government that, um, that causes them some grief? <laughs> Nobody here is a libertarian? Oh my goodness. Well. You know, they're suspicious of it, you know, because the more power that the government has, the more it can <clears throat> manipulate people's lives and interfere with their lives and maybe make decisions that are not as good, okay, as people can at the lower levels. So there are people who dispute this premise that the bigger the better and who would say, no, you know, it's the individual and then the family and then maybe the local community. They're, they're more important and more power should be given to them. But Aristotle believes that um, those lower communities, so to speak, all build and grow naturally to form the larger community. Okay. So what he does in this first part is he breaks down the larger community into its parts to show that they are not um, as complete they are, they are smaller communities, but they're not as complete and they're not self-sufficient um, compared to the city-state, okay? Uh, one thing he says is that a lot of people think that the same type of leadership exists in the smaller communities as in the city-state. So they say that the leadership of master over household, slaves and family, or the relationship between the male and female, the leadership of the male, okay? Um, or the, maybe the leadership of a small community like a village, that these forms of leadership are of the same nature as the leadership of the city-state. And he says, no, that's not true, okay? Now, let's just think for a bit. He'll give us more answers later, but why would it be that you couldn't compare the leadership, but let's, let's forget about the fact that we don't look at the family this way necessarily anymore, but why, why would he say that the leadership of the family, being the male head of household, is fundamentally different in some way from the leadership of the city-state? Because he says some people argue there's no difference. There's authority, there's decision-making, just thinking about the, you know, in, in the case of the family, everybody in the family, their well-being and so forth. So what's the difference? I mean, it's natural for people to think of the king or the leader, the top leader of a community as sort of a fatherly figure, right? And that's an image that's often encouraged. Mm -hmm. Is it because of a blood connection between the okay. king and his people as compared to the father and his family? Okay, that's definitely one difference. So there's no genetic or blood connection. And that makes a difference because for Aristotle, remember, he doesn't agree that it's possible for people to have the same level of affection towards everybody as they have for their family. That's partly why he disagrees with Socrates' proposal for communism. We can't all be brothers and sisters in his view in the same way, 
as you, you know, care for your wife, your children, they care for each other and so forth. Okay, so that is one big difference. Anything else you can think of to refute this idea that other people have that the father of a household is similar to the king or leader of a country? that need to be done in the larger community. You mentioned the military. You could also mention just the maintenance of, uh, the building and maintenance of buildings, public thoroughfares, you know, shipping, transit. I mean, there's all of these different things that need to be done to supply people and to, and to get, uh, you know, create peace and order. Mm -hmm. Could nationalism or something else like that be comparable to genetic? Okay, you could do that, yes, and, some, and people have as, as a way of saying, no, that they are quite similar, that you can develop a love of your country that's so similar to the love of your family through nationalism or through patriotism, yeah. So that would be a counter-argument to say to Aristotle, no, maybe you're wrong. You know? Now, that would be different than Socrates' approach, which is, you know, nationalism doesn't require communism, right? Um, but it would be another route to maybe creating that kind of loyalty and faith in your country. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, he doesn't actually, we're speculating here as to why he makes this distinction. He actually doesn't fully answer it here. He just kind of makes an assertion at first that these types of rule are different, that people that he's talked to are wrong about it if they compare the head of household or, you know, the leader of a small community to the larger community. We know that it has something to do with the level of participation to, in the larger community that he envisions um, that citizens in the larger, communicate, the larger community are able to participate in it, at least they should be able to, um, as free citizens, whereas in the household you have this natural subordination that he's going to discuss between um, husband and wife and between parents and children and between master and servant. Okay. So later on he will bring this out that in the household there's these relationships of in his view superior and inferior leader and led whereas in a political community at least as he wants it to be they're citizens. Okay and the citizens don't submit because they're inferior. They rule and are ruled in turn. They share in rule. So there's that as well. But we'll get more from him about that later. Another aspect to what he says at first there about, about political communities is he, he clearly states in his view that political communities are natural in the same way, you know, not the same mode, you might say, but they're natural, just like the other lower communities are. And in fact, he sees this as sort of, like I visualize this relationship as like an onion. <laughs> and the, at the center of the onion is the family, and then you have the village, and then you have the town, and then finally you have many towns making up the city-state. and. You know, the city-state therefore grows initially out of the existence of the family, okay? So even though the rulership of the city-state is different from that of the family, it's the family that originates first, that is first, and then you have several families, they make a village, and then several villages put together, meld together to make towns, and then you have this final and greatest development, okay? So every community, of whatever kind has its natural origins. Okay? The first community of male and female, he says, has natural origins. Because he says that they come together by nature and not by choice. What do you suppose he means by that? The male and female come together, associate with each other by nature and not by choice. <coughs> 
baser instincts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if he would even put it that way, but definitely instincts, you know, that uh, just like all the other animals in the animal kingdom, and he views human beings as, you know, a, a, an animal species, we have a need to procreate, okay? We have a deep instinct to, you know, uh, reproduce, basically. And those instincts drive us together, all right? So I don't know if Aristotle is actually saying that we have no choice about mate, but we, but he is saying that most of us have no choice about desiring to mate, okay? It's an instinct that, that drives people together and it keeps the species going, okay? So there's that, okay? Um, you can count on nature to make sure that there are enough males and females uh, coming together and producing children. That's probably not terribly controversial, although these days we would, and even back then, we would say not everybody has those instincts, right? I mean, back then, um, homosexual relationships were fairly, fairly common. So, um, but on the other hand, I think Aristotle's looking at the aggregate, he's looking at the whole, he's looking at what keeps the species going, so to speak. So this is what he's saying, all right? Um, now, this assertion <coughs> is a little bit more difficult, and he, even he knows it, and that's why he spends a lot of time on it. He says that by nature, master and slave come together, okay? This takes some uh, figuring out exactly what he means by this, and we're going to look at this more closely. But one of the things he does initially is he distinguishes between the master-slave relationship and the male-female relationship. Okay? So he says on page 2, near 1252, there is a natural distinction, of course, between what is female and what is servile. For unlike the blacksmiths who made the Delphian knife, nature produces nothing skimpily, but instead makes a single thing for a single task, because every tool will be made best if it serves to perform one task rather than many. Among non-Greeks, however, a woman and a slave occupy the same position. So what he seems to be saying there is by nature, women are not servile or they're not the same as slaves. And he'll go into what, that, what the slaves means to him. But he distinguishes between Greeks and non-Greeks. And in general, you know, I will just say that the Greeks felt that the non-Greeks were almost like a different species. That is, the, the Greeks felt that their way of life was the best way of life and the natural way of life. And therefore, they judged what is natural according to what the Greeks did and not what the barbarians did. So it's a criticism of the barbarians to say they treat their women like slaves, okay? All right. So next he says that out of the two relationships, male, female, master, slave, comes the family or household. Okay. So obviously a different, a different view of the household that comes along much later, but for a long time, uh, this is exactly, you know, what was meant by a household. Not only the nuclear family, but maybe the extended family and also the servants that worked with the family. Okay? Several households make a village, and this is natural too, and it's natural at this stage for the eldest to rule. Okay, does that make sense? So even if you look at, you know, um, what happens in tribal societies today, typically it's the eldest or either the eldest or the strongest, one or the other. But most of the time the elders are highly respected and they're the leaders. And this is because why? Why, why do uh, tribal groups tend to revere and obey their elders? They're wise. Yeah, because they've just lived longer and they have more experience, so they know more. I mean, it's just common sense. Okay? Now, some would say, well, that's like the father over the household, but really it's not. Okay, So already a change has taken place, because the father's rule over the household has to do with, in Aristotle's view, biology. Okay? So he can be young, the family can be young, but he's still in a leadership position. 
But in a village, it becomes the eldest because of wisdom, not just because of gender or some other quality. And part of why the village is natural is because Aristotle thinks that people naturally want to live well, and so they naturally congregate together to cooperate. If one family tries to live on its own and supply all of its needs, which we now call homesteading, <laughs> it's probably not going to live as well as if several community, if several families come together and homestead together. Right? Um, and the more that come together, the more there can be an efficient division of labor, and so they can have more than just simply the, the minimal needs of life. Um, and so they're moving towards not only a life of what he calls self-sufficiently, self-sufficiency, but they're moving towards an enjoyable life, okay, by cooperating together and working together. So the bigger the village, um, or if, as we find, several villages finally come together to make a state, you not only can have people making life's necessities, but a lot of other things too. And this is where you get luxuries, this is where you get higher education, where you get entertainment, okay? Um, and so life becomes much more than just survival at this point. Okay? The great city-state, he says, reaches the limits of total self-sufficiency, by which he means supplying everything that human beings want, not just those things they need. Okay? And human beings, by nature, want to live in civilization. And this is natural. This is where they thrive. So in his view, they only reach their full potential in a society where they have access to many good things, okay? where they can develop themselves as people, as citizens. Outside of that, they can live happily, but they can't live the best life. Okay? So he says, it comes into being for the sake of living, but it remains in existence for the sake of living well. And that, that's exactly what he's referring to there the good life, okay? For him, it involves all the things that come with a larger community. <coughs> all of the connections that you can make, the groups that you could be a part of, definitely the civic participation, okay? The higher learning, okay? all of that, okay? So Aristotle was famous for his development of teleological thought. Telos means end or goal. Okay? And so the way that he thinks of it is that from the first community of the family, there is this organic uh, nature of growth. Okay? The family is not enough. People naturally keep aiming through their communities for the best life. Okay? So the aim of the family, the aim of the first community and of the village and so forth is always the city-state. It's always the highest civilization possible. Okay? Now the, the, the thing that this way of thinking does for us is it gives us our ideal. The end is the ideal. So rather than the ideal coming from the mind of Plato in the form of forms or you know abstract ideas based on just reason, Aristotle's idea comes ideal comes from observation of the best societies, of where people are the happiest, where they thrive. Okay? His ideal comes from, in other words, real life and not from abstract reason. Okay? And this was an area of disagreement between him and, Claris, and uh, Plato. Okay? Plato uh, really thought that, that the ideals were in existence before we were born, that they were eternal, that they could be discoverable by reason, okay? very abstract. Whereas Aristotle says, nothing that we, <clears throat> we can't know what we can't see. All of our knowledge comes from our actual experience, not just from abstract reason. Okay? And our reason develops as a result of our observations. So, of course, our ideals must come from our observations of what 
works best, what makes people happiest. Okay? So he's going to judge things by an ideal, but it's the ideal based upon his observations. Okay? And that's what we mean by teleology. It's looking at things according to their natural ends or natural purposes and judging them accordingly. Okay? Anybody have any questions about teleology? Okay, the famous example that's often given in classes is if you look, if you're Aristotle and you look at an acorn, you see an oak tree. Okay? If you decide to grind the acorn up and eat it, it's not going to fulfill its mission. <laughs> it's not going to fulfill its natural end. You've just disrupted the natural process. Doesn't mean he doesn't want you to do it necessarily, but. He sees the tree, okay? And if something happens along the way that, that makes it so that acorn can't turn into the oak tree, then it has not fulfilled its end, okay? All right. Aristotle is also famous for saying that man is a political animal. So on political. And this is very significant for, I guess, for later political thought, so it's worth kind of dwelling on a little bit here. Sounds common sense to political science majors, right? Because we're all political animals. You all spend a lot of time watching the TV news, right, and reading newspapers and, you know, trying to follow politics. You're interested. But have you ever noticed that a lot of people are not very interested at all? that if you asked them, they wouldn't know who maybe the Vice President of the United States was. I mean, that does happen. Who is it? Joe Biden! <laughs> yes. <Dick> Cheney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, so not everybody is as aware in this country, which makes us wonder, are human beings actually political animals? But the way Aristotle sees it is that we have developed, you know, a political community that doesn't encourage participation, okay? Um, and part of the reason for that may be because it's set up with the idea that people are not political animals, actually, but that they're individuals who want to be protected, who want to have their property rights, who want to have, if they want, freedom of religion or freedom of speech, okay? But, but it is not, political participation for its own sake is not the ideal that is, that is promoted here. Okay? Think about that, really. I mean, it's not. Okay? We participate because we are interested. Like right now, I have a friend with an autistic child, you know, and she wants to make sure that legislation is passed in Kansas that will protect the benefits for autism. And so she's asked her friends to um, to write all of the representatives to get that bill passed. So I did that. You know, I'm participating, but I'm participating because I'm interested in a particular benefit that, in this case, my friend needs. But do most of us go beyond that? I mean, most of us don't even do that. Most of us don't go beyond that. We only participate if we feel a direct interest okay, in, in what we, something that we need, want, or we're afraid of. So from Aristotle's perspective, most people in the United States, because of their lack of interest in participation, would not be citizens, okay? And they would not be fulfilling their telos, or their end, because they would not be participating as citizens, okay? And mere voting would not be enough, not that most people do that, because they don't, okay? But even mere voting would not be enough. Um, you would have to actually be more, much more involved than that to be Aristotle's political animal. Okay. So it's questionable, are people really this way? But he says, yes, we are, because first of all, we're social, okay? We're social creatures. We've already seen that we don't, we do our best when we work together. So if we work together, then that means that we have to communicate with each other our plans and ideals. So it's only natural for us to communicate and to bargain with each other and to you know, make arrangements and so forth. Okay. Aristotle actually says if we ignore this tendency in ourselves, we are the worst of animals. In other words, if we don't live in a state with laws, and preferably with good laws, if we're left to our own devices, 
we're worse than most of the animals. Why would that be? Why would it be that human beings would act worse than most animals if they're left unregulated by a community? Well, first of all, I should ask, do you think that's true? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely true. I just think because of, I can use this example of just like weapons. Like, I think, I mean, I think that's just a good example um, because like, I feel like, like said, they can be the best of animals because they have like, the ability to communicate and like love each other, but they also have the ability to destroy each other and like very personal ways because I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do seem to be able to, and not just for survival, right? We don't just kill other people or do harm to them like animals would to survive, but out of you know revenge, prejudice, hatred. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to say an example that like, pops into my head. It's like the Wild West. Um, you know, you spilled my beer, I shoot you, the sheriff tries to stop me, I shoot him too, mm -hmm. as opposed to animals that are only going to kill what they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a, actually, Hobbes makes the same point, that Hobbes and Aristotle don't agree on a lot of things, but, but he also says that, you know, what distinguishes human beings from a lot of other animals is that we have pride, is the way he puts it. And pride or this excessive self-love can lead to, and plus we have free will, right? So this leads to us doing things that seem like harmful to our interests and others, like shooting somebody because they spilled your beer or they insulted you some, in some small way, right? Um, so we have this part of ourselves that's very dangerous if it's not regulated in his view, and, and Hobbes believes it needs to be regulated very strongly to keep it from getting out of control. Okay? So something like that is what's going on with Aristotle here when he says, you know, when he, when he looks at what happens, in other words, in, in his own experience um, of, the, you know, the Greeks' uh, own experience with what happens when government breaks down, like when a civil war develops between uh, the Democrats and the oligarchs, okay? Uh, then you get, you know, a breakdown of authority and people start killing each other. And Thucydides, uh, you know, in discussing what happened during the Peloponnesian War said they would not just kill each other as members of their party, but once government was removed and they were left unregulated, they started to do that to just take revenge against people that they didn't like, too. They used the excuse to do harm to many people just because they didn't like them. So it's not an attractive feature of, of human nature, um, but we do have this side to ourselves. And it, what he's saying is it's natural for us to develop government and laws because without them, the human species wouldn't survive. Just like the birds build nests and the ants build you know, ant hills, uh, you know, human beings build communities because without those communities, we won't survive. And unlike those other creatures, we're our own, we can be our own worst enemy because we do have free will. We have the ability to communicate, which can be used for good but also for ill. Okay? So we need to have a much more sophisticated community um, than these other creatures. Okay? So from his view, law is a natural development. Okay? For Hobbes, it was an imposition. That's what he did. Hobbes, Hobbes said, Law is an imposition. We, we accept it because we must, okay? Whereas Aristotle says it's, it's a natural outgrowth. It's another part of this process. We develop laws because that's what's necessary, not only to survive, but to live well, too, okay? So nature is the standard of, for two, although Aristotle gives it more emphasis even. When you read Aristotle, it's perfectly clear that what he determines to be human nature is the standard by which he judges um, all political systems and political practice. Okay. So the reason why this is important for modern politics is because we do disagree. You know, the founders didn't really think that government and law was natural, they agreed with Hobbes. It's an artificial imposition, it's a choice that we make. We do so in order to survive, to keep our property intact, to have our liberty, and so forth. 
All right. So your author, Arnhardt, um, asks this question. This is question number two. Does political life really fulfill a natural human end? Is, is Aristotle right? Okay. And he asks some questions of Aristotle. He says, well, how does he know when something is natural and, and when it's conventional? How does he really know uh, the difference between the two? Okay. Maybe it's fairly easy to say that the mating of males and females, for instance, is natural, but is marriage natural? Okay, can we really can we really make that leap? Okay. Or maybe we could say, yes, you know, it seems natural for people to cooperate to supply things, but is a political order natural? Does it really follow? You know, or could people like the anarchists say be better off kind of cooperating on their own without government? He also asks, could Aristotle on the issue of women and slaves be mistaking his prejudices for what is natural? This is a, a fairly common critique of Aristotle. That you see what he's saying? That you know, when Aristotle says that men lead and women follow, for instance, or that there are natural slaves and there are natural rulers, that really his observation is tricking him because he's observing what's going on in his own day, in his own society, the Greek culture, and he's assuming that what he sees reflects what is natural and not just cultural. Okay, does that make sense? So how does he really know what is natural? Well, part of part of his response to that is because I see it in the animal kingdom too. That okay, at least for the male female thing. thing. Um, and finally, Arnhart asks, What about the theory of evolution that we now um, accept? Not, not all of us, but I mean, it's a prominent theory. So, what about the theory of evolution? Doesn't it reject or refute teleology? Okay. So, let's get into some of these questions of his. So as far as males and females and natural human communities, Aristotle was a biologist. Okay? So he's looking at human beings, like I said, as members of a species. Okay? And he argues that the union between male and female is natural because we see not just in the human species, but in animal species generally, okay, the desire to procreate. Okay. And that if you look at most animal species, it doesn't seem as though they're making a, a choice about doing so or that somehow that choice could be different. And as a matter of fact, he observes that in a lot of animal species, not all, but in a lot of them, there's also some form of family. And that some species actually mate for life or for a considerable period of time, too. And so there's some variation, but there's enough evidence of this type of behavior amongst other animals that in his view, it makes sense to also conclude that since we observe this so frequently with human beings, it's the same with human beings, okay? He observes that it seems natural for humans to remain with their children, to have that family that continues, they don't just mate and then leave their children. Some animal species do, some don't. And Aristotle, and I'm going beyond what goes on in the politics, he wrote a lot on biology, zoology, okay? And what he says is that there are some animal species that when they bear their children, the children, the babies, are not ready to, um, you know, go off on their own and feed themselves and so forth right away. So for the period of time in which they are unable to do so, where they would be a victim right away of predators if they were left alone, or they would starve to death if they were not fed by their parents. Those families, so to speak, stay together until the babies become adults and are able to do things on their own. Okay? And he observes that human beings' children tend to need that for an extended period of time. 
that it's not until maybe 10, 11, 12 that the human child becomes fairly capable of fending for themselves. And even then, not as well um, as a full-fledged adult. Okay? And so that's a natural support for the idea of the, of the family, um, extended family, staying together okay, for an extended period of time. Right? And then he also argues, of course, that it's natural for this division of labor to occur um, with people in the family and beyond the family working together to supply their needs. All right. So, Arnhardt's an interesting guy. He spent a lot of his time on Darwinian evolutionary theory, trying to reconcile Aristotle and Darwin. That's been his project, because most people think they're opposed to each other. Okay. But Arnhardt argues that Darwin's idea of natural selection does not necessarily contradict Aristotle's teleology, the idea that these things are natural. Okay. So, for instance, Arnhardt says, Darwin's ideas of natural selection and evolution show what he calls an internal directedness of nature towards an end. And the end is survival. Okay. Strength, health, survival, and success. All right. Now, most people object to this and say, but the, the problem is Darwinian evolution doesn't have any sort of ultimate purpose. There's no purposiveness. Okay? There's no intention uh, to it. Okay? So, um, whereas Aristotle's seems to have, there's an intention to it. But, I, but Arnhardt says that's kind of reading almost monotheism into Aristotle. Okay? Which a lot of people in the Middle Ages did. They put the two together. But actually, if you look at what Aristotle's saying, he's not referring to God or some cosmic intention. He's simply pointing to human instincts, and he's observing human behavior. Okay? So it may be that there's not that level of incompatibility between Darwin and Aristotle. Um, these Darwin's ideas do deny uh, any sort of cosmic intention, by which I mean, you know, typically no God in charge of determining things. However, Darwin does say all species seek to survive. Those that are inclusively fit, those that are fit and able to survive, succeed. You know, they pass their genetic material on to the next generation and so forth. So though there, in his view, isn't any um, godlike intention or plan, we still see purpose in nature. Okay? And he says this is very similar, actually, to what Aristotle's saying about telos, about the end of things. Okay? Everything wishes to survive, wishes to succeed, wishes to thrive. Okay? Now, you know, in Darwin, there's much more emphasis on the losers. Okay, you know, those species that aren't inclusively fit, that become extinct and so forth. But, you see what he's saying about the possibility of compatibility here? <clears throat> and can you also see why so many people from the Christian background could see a, a godlike purpose in what Aristotle is writing about? So they said, you know, well, obviously the purpose, the intention, and the end are determined by God. You know, God created human beings to fulfill certain ends, and the end is determined by God. Okay, but Aristotle's thought doesn't, it can be interpreted in that way, but it doesn't have to be interpreted in that way. So Arnhardt has tried to prove that there's no necessary uh, clash. Does anybody have any questions or comments about that whole thing?
So I think that I think Arnhardt's trying to rescue Aristotle from um, the charge that he's not scientific, that he's not um, somehow that he's too old-fashioned to be applicable um, now because we have the theory of evolution and we now know that there's no purpose or plan in it that you know that, that that sort of runs the universe and runs what happens on in, on Earth and so forth, but. Even if that's true, and actually I know Arnhardt is a believer, um, but even if that's true, um, it, you know, he's saying it's not necessarily a reason to ignore Aristotle's reasoning. Arnhardt started out as a Baptist and ended up as a, maybe a, I'm not sure exactly what he is, but he's, like a mainstream Protestant now, I think. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this issue of natural slaves. Okay, remember, it's possible that Aristotle took his own personal observations and experiences of what was going on in Greek society and called it natural. Okay, but that might simply be a cultural practice. Okay? So there's that concern. Okay? And the way that he uses this term slave and natural slave is really pretty complex and he spends quite a bit of time on it, which does indicate that he understands it's problematic. It's not just something that you can say and leave it at that. Okay? He has said that the interests of natural slaves and masters coincide. Okay? And it would seem like that's obviously untrue. Okay? Because you might ask yourself, does anybody want to be a slave of somebody else? Okay. Typically, no, right? I mean, people either get forced into it or they, um, in, in some cases, agree to it for a period of time because they feel like they have to in order to get something else they need. Uh, but it's not something that you would think uh, anybody would choose for themselves. All right, so let's take a look at a couple of things Aristotle says, and then on Friday we'll have to come back to this issue. But on page six of your book, in chapter four, here's one of the first things he says about it. He says, a slave is a piece of animate property of a sort, animate property, as opposed to inanimate. And all assistants are like tools for using tools. For if each tool could perform its task on command or by anticipating instructions, and if the statues of Daedalus or the tripods, tripods of Hephaestus, which the poet describes as having entered the assembly of the gods of their own accord, if shuttles wove cloth by themselves and picks played the lyre, a master craftsman would not need assistance and masters would not need slaves. Okay. Now, just taking that quote, what do you think Aristotle thinks of slaves? What are slaves? Why do, why do people need slaves in this society? Because masters need help, maybe? Yeah, because they need them for their labor. You know? So this would seem to indicate that really it's about you know, needing to use other people to get additional labor which is, I think, the most common view of, of slavery. You know, he's re it's really kind of an interesting thing he's saying there. If, if, you know, you could have a machine that wove cloth on its own, then you wouldn't need slaves. And actually, you know, the death knell of slavery was the Industrial Revolution and capitalism. Okay? Because it, as a matter of fact, the more mechanized society became, the less people needed to have it. Okay? But, uh, he goes on to make some more distinctions about this. Okay, and I'll read this and then we'll leave you with this to think about. He says at the bottom of page 8, Therefore, those people who are different, who are as different from others as body is from soul, or beast from human, and people whose task, that is to say, the best thing to come from them is to use their bodies, are in this condition. Those people are natural slaves. And it is better for them to be subject to this rule, since it is also better for the other things we mentioned. For he who can belong to someone else 
and that's why he actually does belong to someone else. And he who shares in reason to the extent of understanding it, but does not have it himself, for the other animals obey not reason but feelings, is a natural slave. The difference in the use of, made of them is small, since both slaves and domestic animals provide the necessities with their bodies. So that's on uh, the bottom of eight and top of nine, where he describes natural slaves as those who use their bodies and not their reason. They have reason enough to understand the orders, in other words, of those who uh, they work for, but they do not have enough reason to make decisions for themselves. So we'll have to talk about, is Aristotle still dealing with his prejudices? Okay. In other words, is he looking around and seeing most slaves and saying, well, the reason why they're slaves is because they can't use reason, therefore someone else has to make decisions for them. This was the typical justification of the institution of slavery in America, you know, among those who cared to justify it, was the idea that, you know, uh, some people uh, were not capable of taking care of themselves, right? So other people had to more or less take care of them. Of course, that was belied by their treatment, right? But, um, and they could not live on their own, therefore they had to be directed by others, right? So obviously, that was a case of prejudice. What people thought and what was actually true were two different things. So we'll have to ask, is the same true for Aristotle? Is he making a similar mistake? Okay.